Discipleship Thursday, and we've got some good stuff to talk about. Guys, what, what's on the docket? Who, want, who wants to kick this thing off? Man, it better be you. <laughs> well, we, we want to start off with, with what I consider good news. I think we all could agree this is, is good news. This came out yesterday uh, that in, in England, the, the National Health Service in England is no longer uh, prescribing puberty blockers for minors with gender dysphoria for the the transgender is what we call them right, now right, but right. they <clears throat> they have no longer they're no longer doing that except in clinical studies because the evidence is not there to justify the widespread use of these medications oh yeah that's, that's amazing that's their that's their words uh it says we do not fully understand the role of adolescent sex hormones in driving the development of both sexuality and gender identity yeah, and these things have been handing out. Been, we've been handing these things out like candy. Well, this is great well, news. But, but, this, but, but they're also they're not the first. This is not the first country in Europe to do so. Okay. Uh, France did this in 2022. Sweden did this in 2022. Now we had some bad news about France last week, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so this yeah. is good news coming, go. coming out of you. Finland, <laughs> we'll did, the, okay, Finland we'll did this in 2023. Okay. But in to me, one of the big things that came out of this is is, is that is, is their proposed guidelines that they don't recommend these children socially transitioning by changing their name or pronouns during what could be a transient phase. Y y meaning, you meaning, think? <laughs> yeah, their feelings could change. And then uh, you compare that with a case we have in, in this country that's going to the Supreme Court out of Indiana where a child was been re has been removed from the home because of allegations of abuse. DHS came in and disproved the allegations of abuse. There's no abuse at all. But because the parents don't support this child transitioning, they've removed the child from the home and won't put, place the child back with the parents. And we've seen other cases like that too. And, and this is kind of a big deal, you know, because in this country, we're still um, in court over whether the parents can even know, you know, they're still, whether we can fly these things under the radar or not. And, you know, we, we jokingly said, you know, as Europe goes, so America follows. Right. So, okay, let's follow <clears throat> this one, you know? <laughs> So, so we're we're trying to still enable government entities and other entities to subvert the the, the parent, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, as far as their children. And, and all of these countries have said, look, the evidence is not there. Yeah, this is we, dangerous. We just don't know. Yeah, I heard, I heard a discussion on this um, probably about three months ago. The the idea that there is zero long term study of the effects of this, right? Um, and and, and there could be absolutely irreversible damage being done. Who's going to be held accountable for this? I mean, when you look, and, and because it's so politically incorrect to say, hey, look, you really might want to think this thing through. It's not normal. It's not natural. If it was, you wouldn't need it. If it was that natural, you wouldn't need it. So. One of the things they considered in this decision was the, the number of people that are detransitioning. Right. That they're seeing that, that years later they are identifying that they're realizing that, Hey, I'm, I really am a man, right? I, yeah. I, th this is what I really am. And I, this was a mistake. And, and the other thing that, that they talked about is what few studies they have were all revolved around men that decided they identified as women. Right. But the increasing numbers of girls deciding their boys is, is disturbing. And so that was another factor they brought into making this decision. Wow. Yeah. You know, you know, there's, there's, there is help. You know, if, if you're watching and you've made that mistake and you're, you find yourself in there, in, in that you have to look a little bit, you have to dig a little bit, but there is, there is help. Absolutely. That is available. There are, are whole entities and ministries dedicated to helping bring people back from this horrible mistake. And we're, we'll be called transphobic or homophobic or whatever, every other name that you can think. But sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Uh, that may not be true anymore. I just uh, read yeah. something today coming out of our beloved Canada. I think, um, Clay, I think you said that you had seen this, um, you know, earlier. Yes. But the criminaliz criminalization of thought and speech. Listen to this. Canadian law endorsed by Trudeau. 
the Trudeau government could imprison people for life for speech crimes. Hmm. Now, you know, you've heard a lot in the media recently about the need to protect children on social media. So what do we do? We, we criminalize um, speech. Is that the solution? You know, there was a a report or, or who was it? Was it Zuckerberg? Who was it? One anyway, one of the one of the social media owners come in and was apologizing to Congress and and some other things and probably should, but probably not for the reasons that they were. Um, but children have been made victims on these social media platforms. And when I say children have been made victims, there are predators on mm-hmm. these social media platforms. Really, really, Imagine that. you know. And so instead of Instead of encouraging your children not to, at 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15, be involved on some of these social media platforms where they can't, you can't monitor that. You can't control that except to a degree. Sure, you can have things there, but the danger of this, and I want to make this point. A lot of us would say, you know what, we're against hate speech. We're against, we're against hate speech. Here's the problem if you jump on board with stuff like this. Who is determining what hate speech is? Because I can tell you right now in Canada and in a lot of countries in Europe, if you quote what the Bible says, you are you're propagating hate speech. Hate speech. Mm-hmm. Right. So the big problem with that is all of a sudden, you know, again, in the old days, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Now we literally are criminalizing thoughts. We're criminalizing free speech and the ability look I don't I don't think that I think that all speech should have you know you do have consequences you do have repercussions mm-hmm. I don't think anybody should say everything but the but at the same time who becomes the arbitrator of of what is hate speech and what is not and you're you've not done anything and anything that somebody doesn't agree with if I don't call you by your correct pronoun it's hate speech it's because I don't want your rights. We talked about special rights mm-hmm. being being pressed on us. It's not that any any right that is beyond my right that I force you to accommodate is no longer just about me and my rights. It's about control at that point. And I think we see that. But this is amazing coming out of Canada. Yeah. Well, and, let's let's take all this thought to to another level. You know, uh, hate speech uh, versus the the reversal of some of their thinking in in Europe right now. You know, media plays a part in all this. You know, who who is the decider of what is hate speech and what is not? It's what we inundate ourselves with. It's it's the mm. it's the media that we expose ourselves to. Because more and more, you know, you said there's a, a rise in uh, females who have determined that they um, are are the opposite gender of the one that they were born as or that is on their birth certificate. So you see this rise, but you also see this rise. Um, in media, you know, in I'm talking mainstream television, sitcom, movie type media. You know, mm-hmm. th- at, a, at a time, you know, there was uh, the obligatory um, flamboyant gay neighbor on on every sitcom. You know, and now that's gone into a, a more normalized way of thinking about female homosexuality. You know, we see that more and more. It's becoming more and more prevalent in everyday television. And so we begin to drop our guard on these things. We begin to think of this as normal. And so now we have more women. I mean, this may tie directly to the case. I'm not, I'm not a uh, sociologist. You know, I don't, I don't right. necessarily study this, and it's just coming out of this conversation today. But as I see a rise in one and a rise in the other, perhaps that is where this thinking is coming from. So who is mandating what hate speech is? the general populace by what they are seeing and how they are having their their view of the world clouded by the media that they are consuming right yeah it's crazy yeah. you know we, we've been talking along the lines of of world view mm-hmm. and how those world views are are um i'm not going to say dictated how we're inundated with those world views you, we were talking earlier and you said you had some specific some specifics uh how media is doing that well again that's kind of kind of what i'm i'm leaning into just just as a result of the conversation you know right. realizing that we do allow so much of this into our lives it plays a massive role we invite in it we, we seek it out yeah you know, i was i was thinking you know just to understand to give an idea of the impact of media and i don't have the information right in front of me so i'm operating off of memory so uh, you know don't quote me on, on everything don't make me look but, it up but uh <laughs> 
I read a study on um, e the, e the impact of television. They went back and looked at the this this researcher looked at the incidences of uh, eating disorders in the Fijian Islands. Okay. Uh, you know, they were an island culture that typically a a, a larger woman, uh, the a woman being larger, was that was a good thing. That that was a symbol. They came from from a prosperous household. Then television was introduced into those cultures. And within two years, eating disorders went from non-existent to a significant number. I don't remember the percentage mm -hmm. of, of, of girls that were suffering with an eating disorder. In two years, just with the introduction of television. Wow. That, that tells you the power of the media, of what we consume. We, we don't even realize how, like you said, that it started off with just one character on one show, and so we avoided that show, and then it was another character, and, and before you know it, we're watching a show, and there's that character, and we just, we, okay, we just accept it and move on, and then it, it We gets, laugh about it. It, it, gets, it gets bolder mm -hmm. and bolder, and... They're a family member. Now, now it's, yeah. it's normal. Yeah. And I don't want to criminalize media. Uh, I, you know, we talk about, you know, we, uh, we have a tendency to want something or someone to blame for right. things. I don't, want to, I don't want to blame media for doing that. I don't want to blame culture for where we're at. Uh, what we need to do is, is look at ourselves and see how are we addressing these things, you know, because, you know, there's the good, the bad, and the opportunity <laughs> of media. You know, <laughs> we right. have the opportunity to affect the, what media is putting out. We have the opportunity to affect the culture that we are steeped in. That's what we're doing right now. Right. And so, you know, uh, I know with Rockfish Studios, you know, not to, to get specific, you know, this is why Shameless Rockfish plug. Studios does what they do. You know, we Amen. are trying to interject biblical worldview, not just Christian worldview, because that has become more and more clouded, but biblical mm. worldview. That's good. You know, into, into films that not only entertain, but inform and educate and, and leave you with something morally redemptive at the end of the day, That's good. as opposed to just the, the things that we mindlessly consume. And, and like you mentioned, you know, first it was one character, then it was, uh, you know, two characters on two shows. And then, you know, before long, we're just laughing at it, like yeah. you suggested, yeah. because it becomes the norm. We are no longer shocked by the things that we absolutely um, disbelieve. You know, yeah. we d we just accept them, and that's just part of entertainment. Because if we want to watch that thing, then that's what we have to that's what we have to bear. We become a little bit more numb every time we do. We have to eat the seeds with the popcorn and <laughs> chew your teeth on them. You know, I remember watching uh, the Andy Griffith, Griffith show. I guess it's been probably about three or four years ago. I, I, just, I went I went on a binge, mm -hmm. and and some of you may have no idea what I'm talking about. Andy Griffith show. Anyway. Um, I remember noting how that most of these, many of these episodes, they hailed very positive, you know, moral right. points, and as did most television in the early years. But we have we've we've abdicated very often that that mechanism. We've kind of drawn back and said, ah, I don't want anything to do with it, and and that's. We've done that in a, in a lot of cases when it comes to just about every form of of media, and I think it's important that we don't do that. Um, when we when we look at, I was talking earlier, and and I'm probably going to offend somebody when I say this, but I was talking earlier or yesterday with somebody about the idea of the social media and the and the laws and, mm -hmm. and getting you know keeping children safe. One, I don't think children should be on social media. You I can, don't, you can I hate don't me. Disagree I don't with care. You at all. Yeah. My kids were never bullied on social media because they were never on it. I didn't allow that until they turned 18 because they didn't need it and they had enough, enough drama. So if your child doesn't have enough drama in their life, praise God, let them on social media. You say, oh, that's cruel. No, it's cruel what happens on social media. But here's my point. We're going to look at these social media platforms, uh, you know, and, and we're going to try to regulate them to protect our children yet very often it's our very children that are getting on utilizing these platforms to find something they are looking for well it just pops up and it's just being shown yeah maybe but i know kids i know the slant of the human heart very often they're on there looking for it and uh, so if, if, if our kids have access to the information highway and can find any type of anything what do you think I want you to think back if you have kids, what would you have looked 
what would you have looked for? What was the first thing you typed in when the internet came, when Al Gore invented the, the internet and came <laughs> online? You know, the first thing, if you are not a believer, I can tell you what you were looking for and I can tell you exactly what, you, what you'll find. Um, but I think the wise thing is that we, I know this is going to sound crazy, but what if we begin to take responsibility for our children? Oh my goodness. What if we tell them no? What a radical thought. Uh, but, but everybody's doing it and social media, in fact, I remember, I'll never forget this, we talk about how quickly uh, the culture can change and turn and you can become a pariah. I remember being on vacation with my two girls and I think they were probably 14 or 14 and 15 at the time. And we were sitting in a, in a jacuzzi next to a pool with uh, an, another mom and her, and her young daughter. And the young daughter was, they were arguing about, you know, could she, you know, have a phone and be on social media? And they looked over at us and they said, they said, sir, at what point did you allow your children to be on social media? And my girls just started laughing and shaking their heads. And, and I said, well, they're not. And, they're, and, and the little girl's eyes got big and the mom's eyes got big. And she looked down at the girl and said, really? See, I told, you know... You got to look out for them. Absolutely. So anyway, like you said, we can't just blame right. the platform or the media. It's what you do with it. And let's 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 talk about us as adults. It may not be social media. It may not even be entertainment. What about the news media, the so-called news media? Mm -hmm. If you if you only listen to, I may make some people might have Fox News, or if you only listen to CNN. You're going you're gonna to become, you're going to start to think that's all there is, and that's the truth. And, you know, it's why in, in most academic projects, if you're doing a, a report or a study or something, you have to have more than one source. Right. You know, we, we see that, that we get caught up in, we create an echo chamber. Yeah, and so much of what's on those entities and those platforms now are op-eds. They're right. opinion. It's not news. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not news. It's a, it's a filtering of the news through the particular worldview. And, you know, some of those worldviews we may agree with, some of them we may not agree with, but we have to be careful because we're being influenced and they're being created. We're adopting those worldviews, whether we're doing it consciously or subconsciously. And we may think that uh, social media stops at how they, how they target or have been targeting young people, but they target us pretty well too. They do. You know, they, they find what we what we what will trip our trigger, what will what will get us to scroll a little further and hit two more ads. Yeah. And and so they will feed us those things, like you said. You know, if if you are somebody who leans toward Fox News, man, they're going to give you that stuff that's going to that's going to inflame you against the CNN news watcher. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it, it, and and keep you engaged. I mean, that that's the game. The, the big thing on the news now is TikTok. You know, the, mm -hmm. the, right. the House just passed a resolution, actually it was a bipartisan resolution. This will be leveraged into something political, guaranteed. And it's, an, it's at an election time. Even the aspects of, of um, national security and personal security, we give away our information like crazy. Anybody can have it. That does not mean it's wise, even though it's socially acceptable now. But I, I predicted this when this my, my son contacted me. He said, hey, you know, Dad, they're looking at banning TikTok and some other stuff. And I said, I said, there will be protests in the street. I said, there, there will be people. Now, I, I don't know who's sponsoring these pro, pro, uh, protests. I'm not saying it's communist China that's sponsoring these protests, although it's, you know, it's very possible. <laughs> but, but my point is, once people have something like that, they don't see it as a privilege. They see it as a right. Mm -hmm. and, and these platforms are so powerful. And there's some good stuff on, on you know, on, on TikTok. And there's some bad stuff Absolutely. on TikTok, just like with every, every social media platform. But I, I predicted, I said, there will be protests. And sure enough, I, I clicked on today and there were, there were protests over the possible deletion of TikTok. It's just amazing. It just blows my mind how we, you know, we do latch hold of these things. But the, the deal is, again, the good, the bad, the opportunity. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, when, it's how you use a tool. I mean, you could use a hammer for good or for evil. Um, and the same thing with any social media platform, any media platform in general. Yeah. You know, it's, it's how we use what we have. You, you know, we, we had, we've got a program here at Rockfish called My Reach. And one of the ways to reach is to do a social media post to mm -hmm. do a, a, a Christian-based or a, a biblically-based or a gospel-based social media post. Yet, you know, think about how many Christians are on social media. What if just today every 
believer who is on any social media platform simply shared the gospel or shared the good news or shared the word of God in some capacity, think of the inundation that were, would occur. One is to maybe share an online service, and it doesn't have to be a rockfish service. Some of you watching, it, maybe maybe you go to a different church. Maybe you don't go to church. Maybe maybe you you do have relationship with God. What if we did that? I mean, you know, just you look at the potential and the power of the ability to reach. We did a, uh, a shift here in thinking. Instead of, of utilizing social media as merely a platform to invite people to service or to even invite people to, hey, you know, come watch our online live service, we said we want to leverage this very viable, many very viable platforms to, to just send the gospel out to as many as thousands and hundreds of thousands of people as we possibly could. Um, screaming at the darkness, and, and, and the reality is it has opened up an opportunity that every single Christian and every every single church has. I mean, it's something we called it, um, and I don't know that we've talked about it in this context, but we said it's it's equivalent to the Roman roads that were opened up, you know, right. um, mm-hmm. you know that allowed the gospel to really go around the world. Um, so it is it good, used for good or evil? Kind of comes down <laughs> to, to the heart of man. Um, anything else to talk about? Anything else we want to discuss? Like you said, it's just, just keep in mind you talked about last night be careful how you hear oh yeah you know mm-hmm. when we're when we're on social media you know yes we can use it for good and I, I believe people have have started out with good intentions you just have to be very intentional so that you don't get caught up in the the doom scrolling and yeah. and and watching all of the stuff learn how these these platforms that they learn you really well. Yeah. We need to learn them and figure out how we can use them and always keep that that mindset when you're engaging on social media yeah. or with social media is, is what is your purpose for being there? Yeah, these are powerful tools. What if what if you went back and you what if we encourage people or do you think this is a possibility that if you were to look at your last 10 social media posts, you would see your worldview being expressed? Mm. What, what, what if that's a test? So th- there's a challenge. Go back to your last 10 social media posts and you'll see kind of where your mind and your heart and your filters are. We should probably do a study on that. There's got to be one out there somewhere. This is kind of why I have backed away from using social media the way that I did when it was first was a thing. You know, because I I saw that I had the tendency to do what was expected on the platform. You know, I mean, yeah, I shared the gospel. I shared I shared my worldview right. through the things that I did. But I, I think the most important thing that we could probably take away from this part of the conversation is the responsibility that we have as parents. We need to be teaching our children not to simply consume media, be it social or otherwise, passively, but rather to instill a biblical worldview in them, in the home, and expose them to that repeatedly so they'll learn to uh, engage with media in whatever form critically, that they'll begin to to understand when something that is ingenuine or something that is there to harm mm. or something that yeah. is untrue comes across their path, that they recognize it right away, but they're only going to get that in the home. You know, I've, I've heard Christian schools advertise, well, they get that in all the hours they spend in school here, and that's true too. <clears throat> But we have got to make sure that we are giving them this biblical worldview so they can see the world through that lens and begin to to recognize when when something strays from that and when something just is not true so that they can critically affect their world. Uh, yeah, I was, I was watching a, uh, a fight on social media recently. Um, <laughs> you know, th- th- that's what it turns into very often. And it was, it was between Christian families. <clears throat> and one Christian family was saying that uh, that w- was really just kind of just, just saying the dangers and heralding the dangers of having your children in a public school. And the other, you know, parent chimed in and said, so you don't believe God's big enough to use your children, you know, to be salt and light in the public school. And a verse came to mind. And again, I, I didn't chime in on the fight. Thank you, Jesus. Now I can talk, now I can talk about it from a, a neutral <laughs> perspective. But a, thought, a, a word came to mind. It says, train up your children in the way that they should go. Mm-hmm. If you believe that public schools are training your children in the way that they should go, fine. 
But it, it, the Bible says that you are to train up your children in the way that they should go. For you to take your children and send them somewhere that is indoctrinating them in, a, in something totally different than the Word of God because children are still in the formative ages, still in those formative years. To think that a, a child unless you grew up in a pastor's house or something, that your child has enough clarity and doctrine to at 10, 12, 14, 15 years old to go into that, those indoctrination um, mechanisms and, and not come home and, and start sharing with you what their preferred pronouns are. You're, you're deceiving yourself. You know, I'm not always looking for the devil in the details, but I can see him all the time. Yeah. You yeah. know, when I see how I, you know, I've, I've been American the whole of my life. So, oh, okay. so I, I, I kind of have seen things flow a, a way or two. And as I see that we have had more people become dependent on the income that comes from a two income family, right. uh, where they are having to send their children somewhere else to be educated, right. where they're not able to educate them in the home because of time constraints. Um, I see where there is more leeway for um, uh, a nefarious message to get in there. And, there and I don't think it starts out that way. I think, I think it slips in little by little and worldviews that, that other people are exposed to, including the educators and those who are above the educators telling the educators how to educate, you yeah. know, as they have their worldviews clouded or distorted and they are anti-God and the things that we would say that are pro-Bible, pro-God become hate speech you know, that they flow that right down on right downhill to our children, to public schools, and even, unfortunately, through other schools as well. And, and one thing that I think we fail to realize is, is some of the most influential uh, assets in, whether it's public school, private school, whatever, are the other children. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I tell people when it comes to youth groups, very often um, it's pulled ignorance. <laughs> you know, that's why you need a very strong youth ministry with somebody. And when I looked at worldviews, there was a study done recently about pastors who had biblical worldviews. And I want to say it was like 38% of pastors had biblical worldviews. Mm -hmm. And by the time you got down to, to youth pastors and youth leaders, it was like 19% who had biblical worldviews. Um, and, and the children, when they get together, they influence each other. And nine times out of 10, it is not for good. I mean, the children aren't birthed with these, these great moral compasses on the inside of them, you know, to begin with. Mm -hmm. And all it takes is a little validation or, or a little bit of herd mentality, you know, and all of a sudden, man, you can get, you can get into a mess. And any parent out there knows exactly what I'm talking about, because what happens is when your kid says that ugly word, you go, where did you hear that? And then they, br they blame Junior down the road or they blame it on somebody else when y'all were watching it on television last night. This another story. I got one more thing I want to hit on. And this is a kind of a hard deviation, but this is something that's coming out of Austin, Texas. This is over 80 bands, and these are your musical artists and these guys here. That's what a band is generally. Anyway, over 80 bands have <laughs> left the popular South by Southwest Festival in Austin, Texas. Would you like to know why? So over 80 bands have said, we are not going to be part of this South by Southwest fest Festival in Austin, Texas, in protest of the U.S. Army's sponsorship. So because the United States Army is sponsoring this festival, these artists, 80 bands, have said, we are not going to participate. Man, patriotism is at an all-time high here in America, isn't it? It sure is. I mean, we, we, you know, patriotism, you don't hear that word anymore. It's been replaced by another word. It's been, um, it's been replaced by nationalism. Mm -hmm. So the word patriotism, and many of us, now you're going to recognize how this indoctrination happens and how it happens so subtly. Indoctrination happens when we begin to think according to a, a set formula or a set way or set principles. So we, we left patriotism and went to nationalism. So there's a new word out there. Christian nationalism. Mm -hmm. So Christian patriotism. So any Christian who is a patriot, and I, I submit to you that all Christians, if they are living in any kind of decent government, should support their governments biblically, you know, when they're, when they're not doing something evil and wicked. They should support their country 
Yes. Okay, we should be the best citizens that are out there. I can show you that in the word of God over and over if you want to, you know, send in something, let's talk about it. But, but the reality of it is that when you talk about Christian patriotism, it's been twisted doctrinally into Christian nationalism, which is a negative connotation of patriotism. So they say nationalism to the exclusion of others so they can attach names, mm-hmm. names to you. So you used to be able to be a patriot. Now you can no longer be a patriot. You're a nationalist, which carries a negative connotation. But these folks are boycotting this concert and participating in it because the U.S. Army is involved because they do not support the idea that the American military, U.S. military, has somehow offered help to the Israelis in their fight against the Palestinians. Oh, so all of a sudden you see, you know, how this is all connected and kind of all runs mm-hmm. together. Uh, we're, we're seeing the world kind of set its stance, you know, its ideology. We've seen this in academia for years where Israel has been vilified. Um, but I want to say this, and we talked about this a little bit off air, um, the idea that if when America was tack- attacked in 9-11, we responded to those terrorists and those the origin of those terrorists in Iraq and, and Afghanistan, and we should have, and we did, and the world supported us. Something similar to that has happened to Israel, and, you know, we should support that. And again, you have to ask, why don't we? Well, because the doctrine and the level of patriotism and the level of, of support has been just eroded over time. And you have to go back to what you said a few moments ago about something else. It's a herd mentality. mentality. So we get a bunch of people doing what the other people did because that's what's in vogue at the moment. Mm. It's like when, you know, uh, when they wanted to talk about gun control on television, all these people who star in these shoot 'em up uh, movies are on, suddenly they're telling me that, that we have got to have gun control because um, people view uh, violence in an inappropriate way. And they're the ones that are making the movies right, that are the shooting one, everyone. Exactly. <laughs> so so we, we get this hypocrisy um, at every level. Good um, word. And, and the, the, the thing with the majority of these bands is they haven't got a clue about actual world affairs. Right. You know, I, I would I'd be uh, really slow to take my uh, world-leaning advice from, from any one of the, the best guitar players that I know. Right. So, yeah, but they have influence. You know, I was That's listening. I was listening to somebody say this. They said that we'll give you the government, we'll give you the laws. You give us the artists and the creatives, and we'll influence your culture. Mm-hmm. And they they utilize that, unfortunately, you know, to to win the hearts of our children and to slant our minds and our thinking towards such you know towards such things. It's a it's a it's just a reality. It's just and true. here's the deal. I'm not even going to go get a list of them and boycott them. I'm just going to realize that they were fools before too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, that's mean, but yeah. But but what happens is, I think this was said very very early on by some patriots. You know, it it just take in order for evil to flourish, it just takes good people to sit by and do nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I believe that as the family goes as things go in the living room and in at the kitchen table and in the home and in the local church is is absolutely reflective of what we see going on in that nation and there's no church in some nations and you see the results Mm -hmm. there's no hiding from it so final thoughts i'm hearing uh, from from our conversation the the big thing the big takeaway is a clarion call for parents to get involved if we want to, if we want to affect the the next generation, if we want to affect the future, we have to get involved. We have to stand for what's right. We have to be involved in our kids' education. We can have a public school, private school debate anytime, but it doesn't matter. Uh, I've taught in a private school. I've had kids in a private school. You run into the same issues in private schools as far as the influences and and, and the other kids as you do in public schools. Uh, parents need to be involved. You That's need right. to know what the school is teaching. You need to work to teach your kid to think critically because if you think the schools have time to teach your kids to think critically, they don't. They, they have time to teach your kids hopefully enough to pass a test because that's the, the measure of success. Yeah. And, and get involved. Yeah. That's the thing. Be involved. Know what's going on in the world beyond what the the mainstream viewpoint is 
yeah. beyond what the, 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 your preferred <clears throat> media wants to tell you. Right. Know what's going on. And this is not just for parents. I would say this is for everybody. Uh, for parents, I'll specifically say, start giving your kids what they need, not what they want. Mm. That's what parents are supposed to do. Well, how dare you say that? No, that's what parents are supposed to do. Uh, Dan, final thought. Well, I think we as the church need to be more involved to, you know, especially when it comes to media and influence, because there are good sources and there are good resources Amen. out there. We need to be willing, like, like a good youth leader would be, to, to step up and to step in the way and help people make good decisions, help children make good decisions. When you're sitting at home and you have mindlessly scrolled and found just a movie that you want to watch and it comes across that scene or that character that is absolutely against biblical values, turn it off go to the next thing do, or do something else. You know, begin to recognize these things and you'll begin to see how your, your children, your family, your church is being influenced. We need to be honest. Yeah, no, absolutely. That just happened recently in my home. There was a series, I really wanted to watch it and it was a really good series, but even from the onset, the, the very premise of it was this guy had two moms and, and they were in every other scene uh, it showed them in bed together. It showed them doing their stuff. I'm not a homophobic, okay? I'm not scared of anything. But to promote deviance, which is a deviation from truth, mm -hmm. to me at every single turn would be equivalent to me going on every single sermon and saying homosexuality is wrong and it's condemned in the Bible, which it is. I unapologetically say that. The Bible is very, very clear on that. Any theologian or anybody else who tells you that is lying to you. Read the word concerning that. That's just the truth. But you don't hear that in reverse, and we don't see it. But when we begin to respond by turning the garbage off, mm -hmm. until we do that as parents, don't expect your children to do right, that. Right, and, right. Um, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. There is some alternatives. And if we start taking those alternatives they will start responding appropriately because they're concerned about one thing generally. There you go. They're concerned about the money. Mm -hmm. And when I, am, when I am financing those things that I stand against, I, there comes a point where I have to ask myself that question. And see, that's the thing. If, if you, when you begin to understand how that whole thing works, you know, they pay to license those shows. And if you're not watching the shows that they're paying for, they will go away. They will go away. Maybe they'll stop paying for what's not bringing them back a return. Yeah, but the enculturation is so great that people are looking at that now and going, ah, that's just the way everything is. It's not how everything is, but it is exactly how everything is mm -hmm. becoming right. and will progress to be. Hey, look, thank you so much for being with us today. Please like this, share this, leave your comments there. Um, unless they're ugly, then don't leave them, keep them to yourself. Anyway, the, um, if you have questions or you have something that you'd like us to discuss or talk about, uh, we'd love to talk about it. We're going to be live here every Thursday, God willing. And, um, thank you, Clay, for being here. Thank you, Dan, for being here until next time. Have a great Great week. Goodbye.